expressed something to me. And they said that taking the high out of the medicine can be a misguided action for, for many reasons. But probably the most important one, they said, is that it may affect the intention of the whole plant and reduce our ability to explore one of the most significant side effects this miraculous botanic can offer, shifting consciousness. Every step we take, every joy, every hardship, is part of this preparation. And the decisions that we make, the means by which we choose to serve, this is our training ground for becoming the masters of our own lives. I um, have a little piece here that I want to... So, does this work? Yes, there we go. Um, this is what we do at our weekly meetings. Um, I'm going to go back for a second because I don't know how to work this. <laughs> Sorry. It's forward and backward, but... Um, these are uh, our weekly meetings and our, and our participation in the garden. We come together a lot. People are in community often. And it's one of the ways that we know what one another needs. It's how we understand how the medicine works because we don't just give something and somebody walks out and then they take too much and they're on the edge of their seat or everything comes with instruction, participation. Members are part of their own healing. It's a holistic, you can't heal unless you're involved in it. Well, who knows? What do I know about healing? You can do anything, but it looks like it's a whole lot more effective to participate in the process of healing. So how we do that is we affect our changes by participating with one another <clears throat> in community and looking at ourselves as a, the universe, the or whole organism. Um, these are some of the things that we do. Um, each week we participate in a kind of holistic approach. Right now we're studying uh, Joel Furman's book, Eat to Live. Um, and studying means that we pull out parts that apply to ourselves and one another. We all use marijuana. Well, actually, no. There are three WAM members who don't use marijuana, but they're still WAM members. And they participate in a very interesting way. And, um, but we listen to sometimes practices. We work with neuroplasticity plasticity exercises, we read, we talk about uh, the design for the materials that are for the next week. We have a kind of holistic meal. We, we do a, a nat uh, naturopaths come and speak with us, physicians, attorneys. Um, we pass on the information that we've gained from one another and share that information. And often one of the elemental pieces that we engage in is the service to other patients, things that they might need, everything from a delivery or picking up children or shopping, anything that one might need. It's a picture of our garden and harvest. And um, we get to grow outdoors. It's so nice because we, thanks, Alan was part of our team, and thanks to Alan and pro bono attorneys and DPA and ACLU, and that we are able to do this every year. We've grown in this particular garden for 20 years. Um, I want to talk about... Is it coming? Okay. Um, there are two... Um, I'm, I'm going to kind of rush through this because I'm bringing forth some historical pieces and there's a lot of history. But <clears throat> we use the... Thanks to Martin and Fred... Um, I had been looking for CBD for some time, CBD-rich plants, and thanks to Martin and Fred, um, they joined, they uh, came to the garden and got us some medicine to grow, and we have a huge uh, CBD garden now, and for the last four years have been working on developing these strains, and the application and of single-use application and combination therapy of the Milagro oil with the CBD. Can you explain a little bit about CBD? Um, right. So what CBD is one of the cannabinoids. And it ha the, when I say CBD plants, I don't mean only CBD or one-to-one -one ratio CBD necessarily, but a richer cannabinoid bit profile uh, where the THC is less dominant. So it has a – CBD is anti-spasmatic. Uh, it has um, – anti-metastasis properties, anti-cancer agents. It sort of builds a protective agent, if you will, around the cell. It makes a stronger, healthier cell. Um, 
Some people find it useful for pain. We have not found it useful for neuropathic pain, at least in our patient profile. Again, we deal with very, often deal with very extreme cases. It may mean that we've not just come across the right combination. Now, what we have found that interrupts pain is CBD and Milagro oil, but the Milagro is very strong, and you'll see the, the profile of that here. Um, we're, we're, we have the Milagro that has a 56% THC. It's too much, it's high. Um, is it too much for everyone? No, but it might be too much for some people, and I would suggest that it's, it can be an uncomfortable dose. To take a gram of that straight out of the, um, the gate can make you very uncomfortable. Even an experienced psychedelic uh, journeyer is going to have a little bit of trouble with that. I can just about guarantee that. Now, nobody, you know, you can't lump everybody in the same bucket, but maybe Maybe that's why uh, marijuana is included in MAPS this year. Maybe somebody got a hold of some Milagro. <laughs> Somebody's got to tell Rick that. I'll tell him. Anyway, um, <laughs> so this, you see here the ratios that we're presently working with. I was just wondering if you could uh, maybe point those little guys in the back. Oh, you can't hear me? I'm so loud. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I feel better controlled. Thanks. Thanks. Appreciate it. Okay, so um, you can see the ratios that we're working with, and with that, we're, we also have a one-to-one -one ratio. I um, have not found that extremely effective, although many, we, we hear that a lot of people do, um, THC to CBD. Um, and we're working with, t we've just developed some THCA. Um, what, what am I doing? Five minutes? Jesus. Sorry. Okay, so that's the fastest 20 minutes. Okay, so I just want to, I want to just <clears throat> look through the 60-year-old female with breast cancer, no progression symptoms at Stacy's. I'm just going to read, read, you know, you might even talk about it. Uh, legally acquired Milagro oil has been really effective in uh, reducing cancer, helping people in, with remission. But there's something that I want to show you. There's a, this baby I started working with when he was just a little over a year old. He has infantile spasm, West syndrome. It's a catastrophic childhood seizure disorder, sometimes two, three hundred seizures a day, violent seizures. His mother has revived him in the, prior to the last two months, maybe in a week, ten, seven, seven times she revived him in a week. So she's a single mom, dad left, her parents died in a plane crash, um, has nobody to, sometimes I say I'm like her, the auntie or the dad or something. So. Um, he was completely non-responsive after these seizures, and um, she just called me and she said, Levi is way more alert. He's smiling appropriately, making eye contact, and has fewer seizures. He is still having them, but less and less violent and much quicker. He is now off Onfi, and I am waiting to begin. I'm wanting to begin the weaning of Kepra. I'm just so happy. I'm going to show you. Now, I want to, how does this do? How, how am I going to make this quick time work? One more time. Click it. No. This is a very important piece of my. I'm not going to be able to do it. Damn it. Okay. Technology. This is a, a video, a quick time video. I'm going to just show you. This is him actually trying to crawl. He has not moved. He has not moved. This is in the last two weeks. And he's trying to crawl. He could not hold his own head up. And he was, his mother finally told me two months ago that he's a vegetable and that it was the hardest thing for her to say. Do you see him? Do you see him moving? <coughs> That's no. him crawling. Okay, this is, you know, maybe he will crawl. Do you want to walk around? Did you see that? So this is, you know, this is the miracle when you think that nothing can change and then something does. And I probably have no more minutes. Now here's the history of medical marijuana. <laughs> Go, it's okay. I, you you have uh, three or four minutes left, and we have other folks who will go through some of the history. Some of this too. So blah 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 blah. So it started a bit before my time. It started a bit before all of our times. I wanted to say that the reason, again, 
that there is even, that I'm not in jail. I want, it's because of my attorneys, it's because there's a movement, and it's because really the will and the ferocity of the people desiring to change the law, demanding that it be different, that's why I'm not in jail. If this had, you know, if this would have happened in the 60s, I might just be getting out, who knows. Um, just going to run through this. Luster, some of the things, Robert Randall, and a few pictures. DEA, 1988, Judge Young recommending that uh, marijuana be put into, from Schedule 1 into Schedule 2. And then in 90, the discovery of the cannabinoid receptors in the body. You know, it's been a continual, continual battle. 90, 91, Dennis Perone, and in 90, in San Francisco, did measure um, P, I think it was. And then in 92, measure A passed, and that's the first year that Mike and I got arrested. We got arrested the next year in 93, and then by the DEA in 2002. And 2002 is critical because that's when um, our attorneys, including Alan, um, stepped in to help us challenge the law. We did so successfully. You guys can be reading. You don't need me to read to you, right? Good. <laughs> um, and it, when they stepped in and did this, um, we sued the federal government along with our city and county, and um, they backed down. Um, did they back down? Uh, does the government back down? No, they just move over, reposition themselves, get some new guys, to, minions to work for them, and keep printing money. Um, <laughs> and so, right? One minute. So, I want to give you a little bit more, blah, 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 blah. So, um, um, since then, uh, we've made an, a settlement with the government, and um, you can see that this rescheduling, the source, this in 2007, the matter of Lyle Craker, the DEA administrative law judge, uh, Alan Bittner, recommends allowing a new source of marijuana research. Um, did not, has not happened. Um, Oh, it says 2007, that should be 2002, oops. Um, again, 2009, DEA Deputy Administrator Michelle Leinhart uh, issued a final ruling regarding Quaker's petition, but it isn't, there is no real final ruling. Um, you know, today we find that there are a few psychedelics that have become legal, legally accessible um, to be used as, uh, to be used as um, medicine, but we see that um, Marijuana is still in Schedule 1. And it's really quite interesting that marijuana remains in Schedule 1, but psychedelics are accessible as, as medicine. These are just a few of the heroes of our time. And these are the three patients in the IND program, three of the, of the six. Um, this is the 1990 scientif uh, scientists discovered the cannabinoid receptors in the brain, in the basal ganglia, in the hippocampus, and in the uh, cerebellum. This is anandamide. It's Beautiful little 1992 discovery. Um, and, you know, again, nothing happens alone. Um, I knew you worked with me uh, at WAM before she headed off to Israel and now still works in the, for both for MAPS and still works in the medical marijuana industry. And um, I, I want to thank you for your time and I'll leave this up here. Is that correct? Okay. So, appreciate it. Sure, okay. Let me uh, tell you uh, how Prop 215 came about, at least in my experience. Um, I got involved in this issue, the marijuana issue in general, uh, first in 1987, sort of at the height of the uh, war on drugs, the middle of Bush, Bush one war on drugs. Um, uh, and at that time, my interest in marijuana was as a recreational user. Basically, I look at marijuana as a consciousness expanding drug, as a psychedelic drug, and felt that, you know, people, Americans should have the right to use it, and it ought to be legal. Uh, I had heard that marijuana might have some medical value, too. At that time, there were stories about how uh, it, might, it was good for glaucoma or uh, possibly for cancer chemotherapy, uh, as an anti-nauseant. Um, I had mixed stories about that. I sort of regarded that as a side issue that was really separate from the issue of uh, general legal use. Um, 
but my uh, attitude toward it started to change as uh, uh, I became more involved and uh, started, for example, uh, taking on the responsibility of answering the normal phone, where people call in, we have a hotline, and people have problems one way or another with marijuana or marijuana laws, uh, 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 talk to us. And what I discovered early on was I was getting a lot of calls about people who uh, found that marijuana was uniquely valuable for their medical condition, and they wanted to know how could they get it legally, or else they had been arrested or something like that and were complaining about the fact that they needed it for medicine and why were they being arrested. Um, and the other interesting thing about these calls, which were really pretty persistent, was that they weren't coming from people with glaucoma or using cancer chemotherapy, but from people with all sorts of different conditions. Um, a lot of them involved uh, really severe pain and muscle spasticity disorders. In fact, the first, first patients I encountered had uh, spinal pain due to trauma of one sort or another. But I started hearing from people with other rare conditions I'd never heard of. Uh, trigeminal neuralgia, neuropatellar syndrome, Coutts yeager syndrome, eosinophilia myalgia, tic de Meniere's disease, Drusen cyst, Crohn's disease, and fibromyalgia. I had to get a medical dictionary to deal with it all. And I found all of this very curious. Uh, I also found it disturbing how the uh, medical issue was not being processed as fast as one would have hoped by the federal government. When I first got involved, uh, Francis Young, uh, of the, D the DEA judge, was still holding hearings on rescheduling marijuana for medicine. And those actually hearings occurred in San Francisco. I went there. You know, I thought, gee, well, they've got a lot of good evidence here. This medical issue should be solvable uh, in, in fairly short order. Of course, I was. Uh, totally deluded in that, as it turned out. Um, uh, as, as I discovered, actually fairly early on, when Francis J uh, Young was overruled by the DEA administrator. Um, but around the same time, um, the HIV epidemic really broke out big in the uh, Bay Area in particular. And um, of course, the, the HIV population and the gay population had were very politically active, and they were interested in patients' rights, and there had become, a, a, there had developed a, a real interest in the use of marijuana to treat people with, at that time, uh, what was called AIDS wasting syndrome. Um, uh, and uh, the, uh, the, the uh, gay community was starting to get interested in this, and the uh, uh, medical community in general. Well, about that time, I met a, 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 a well-known gay marijuana activist in San Francisco named Dennis Perone, who um, decided that this was an issue that was worth putting on the ballot. Um, and this was a time when we were absolutely nowhere in the poll where, where if you took a poll about should marijuana be legal, you know, you were getting like, you know, in the Bay Area, 20% yes kind of response. Um, but I, I remember Jack Harrow was peddling a hemp initiative at the time, and I tried to dutifully uh, uh, circulated. It was a really hard sell getting any signatures on that. And I remember Dennis saying, gee, I, I don't think that, we, uh, that, that I can push that initiative. But you know, if, if we do a medical initiative, and if we do it here just in San Francisco instead of the whole state, I bet we can win that. And that was a brilliant inspiration on his part. Dennis Perlman went on to organize what became known as San Francisco Measure P, uh, the Compassionate Use Measure of San Francisco, that just put the city on record in favor of medical marijuana. Uh, I got involved in that campaign with him, uh, sort of my baptism in politics. And much to our astonishment, uh, uh, we didn't score where I thought we would end up in the high 60s. We actually got 80% of the vote. So when that happened, we realized we were on to something and uh, went on 
carried the same campaign to Santa Cruz, uh, and uh, the legislature took attention, and we started getting bills coming out of the legislature from Senator Mello, Santa Cruz, from Senator Marks, from San Francisco. Uh, medical marijuana bills actually passed the legislature, uh, only to be vetoed by uh, the governor, uh, Pete Wilson, at the time. Uh, Around the same time, I should point out, the crisis over medical marijuana sort of got exacerbated when the uh, Compassionate Use IND program was shut down or closed to new entries by the Bush administration. So it's like there, 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 were, there was no alternative now for people who really needed marijuana for medicine. So at that point, uh, we decided that we ought to take this to the statewide ballot uh, and, and try to actually get laws changed. Now, I should point out that medical mar Dennis had established a medical marijuana club in San Francisco after Prop P. Uh, even though there was no formal change in the law, he had enough of a mandate from the 80% of the vote to be able to do that. Uh, and similar things started help happening elsewhere in the state, Santa Cruz and elsewhere. But we really wanted the state law behind us. So um, out of that, uh, the, the, uh, what became uh, Proposition 215 was born. And the basic concept was very simple. It allows people to use or possess and cultivate marijuana for personal use if they had a physician's recommendation. And it also made clear that physicians were allowed to recommend it. Uh, basically, it was written as uh, giving people, individuals the right of access to marijuana. The cultivation provision was absolutely key to this because we realized there was no way we could get the medicine to anybody unless we did this. Um, the uh, alternative, of course, would have been to try to set up some sort of distribution system. Nobody at that time had a clue as to how we could possibly go about it. We realized that that would involve all sorts of regulatory complications, conflicts with federal law. Um, and uh, we just didn't uh, feel like we ought to go there. Besides, the legislature had passed a bill that was pretty much identical to Prop 215, uh, the bill that was vetoed by the governor, uh, a bill which also legalized just the possession and the cultivation of marijuana for personal use. The legislative bill, however, only allowed marijuana to be used for four conditions, uh, not even including chronic pain. So I'm glad the bill got vetoed because Prop 215, the major point about Prop 215 is it allowed marijuana to be used for any condition for which marijuana provides relief. Um, I should say there, there, there was some concern by some political consultants later on about this whole cultivation provision. The cultivation provision was, in fact, the least popular part of the bill, uh, of, of the initiative. We did pre-polling on this, and when you ask Americans, should people be able to have marijuana as medicine, you got a very good response. But when you ask them, should people be able to grow their own medicine, very contra people were split on that. Americans should sort of brainwash this notion that they have to buy their drugs from some sort of drug company and they shouldn't be allowed to get their own medicine. But the larger uh, mission of the initiative, the override, uh, overrode the, uh, the, the objections, I think, to this personal use cultivation, and uh, we, we stuck with it. Well, as everybody knows, uh, the Prop 215 campaign came out very well. We got 56% of the vote. Um, and then, of course, we had to deal with the consequences. Um, and let me say, I didn't spend a second thinking about what would happen after Prop 215 <laughs> I, <laughs> until after November 5th. Um, I, we didn't know what would happen. We knew it would be incalculable. Uh, now, as it turns out, there are a lot of things I didn't foresee. Uh, uh, I think uh, underestimated, in fact, the actual medical demand for marijuana, uh, underestimated the willingness of doctors to recommend it, underestimated the potential for legal distribution under the uh, legal framework we provided, 
uh, underestimated badly the uh, federal stonewall on this. If you had told me that 20 years later I'd still be talking about this and federal law would not have changed one inch, I would have been astonished. But that's where we are at the moment. But let me run over a, a few of these other developments um, uh, in the meantime. Uh, the first thing that really surprised me the day after we uh, got 215 passed was the number of medical users who suddenly seem to be coming out of the closet. I mean, all these people I knew all my life had been smoking pot with and everything else, suddenly were declaring themselves to have some sort of medical use, which I had never suspected before and which they hadn't talked of before. Um, and, you know, sometimes it was anxiety or, uh, you know, backaches or depression or cramps or whatever. Uh, seemed sort of less than life threatening dire type of medical situations. I knew that this was going on all along because I'd hung out at Dennis Perone's club and even before Prop 215, I mean, he had uh, 10,000 patients there uh, by, by uh, the time of Prop 215. I knew that a lot of people there were sort of friends of Dennis who'd been smoking pot for a long time, and yeah, they had some sort of medical complaint, but it wasn't clear to me that every time they were lighting up, it was because they were having an attack of some sort. Uh, they just liked to smoke pot. But it, it seemed harmless enough, and uh, the, the environment that Dennis was providing uh, for use in general seemed such an improvement over the street scene and the Ill illegal scene that, you know, it, it, it looked to me like uh, uh, an, an improvement on the situation. But very early on, you started hearing criticism of this. People started objecting, hey, Prop 215 was for people with serious, this is for serious diseases. It's being abused. Now, what, what, let me say about that. If you read Prop 215, the introduction, the statement of purpose to Prop 215 says it's to ensure that people with serious medical conditions can get marijuana. But the actual law itself doesn't really mention anything about serious conditions. It says for, you know, you can be uh, recommended for any condition for which marijuana provides relief. And I never saw it as limiting use to serious conditions. Uh, but this is totally justifiable if you, realize, if, if you realize how much hassle it is to try to sort out the serious conditions from the non-serious conditions. You know, it means sending the patient to a doctor and getting, going through all sort of bureaucracy and paperwork, and it really isn't worth the trouble. Um, and let me say, uh, we've done some polling in California about this more recently, and Californians sort of understand this too, even though this, there, there is a perception that the medical marijuana system is somehow being abused or people, almost anybody can get marijuana for medicine, as it turns out. Uh, but it's okay. Californians don't think that's okay because it's probably best for the patients anyhow because there, there, there wouldn't be, it wouldn't be as easy for them to get the medicine uh, without it. Um, so... Um, that's been an ongoing paradox, though, that, that, that we've had to deal with or in, in, in public perception. Uh, let me just say other things that I had not uh, uh, appreciated about the law was, well, I, I, I did not understand how easy it was going to be for doctors to actually recommend marijuana, that people, that doctors would actually become specialists in marijuana recommending. And my good friend, Dr. Todd Nicaria, who taught me so much about marijuana and medicine, was really the pioneer in this. He was a practicing psychiatrist, and he had like 9,000 9, patients of his own that he'd seen over the years. Um, a lot of them psychiatric patients, because he being a psychiatrist, and he was boldly recommending marijuana for not just chronic pain, but for sleep disorders, depression, anxiety, PMS, things like this. And lo and behold, he was getting away with it. I mean, he did have a scrape with the medical board, uh, but he got through that. Um, uh, the, uh, he, I, I will say the patients that, uh, th that uh, were brought to testify at the hearings by the medical board were really very sick patients. I mean, they had severe anxiety, severe depression, and so forth. And uh, uh, Todd got a slap on the wrist for that, but uh, he resumed practice. In the meantime, 
many more practitioners opened up. And to my shock, they even started advertising in the newspapers. <laughs> uh, I, I never dreamed that the, 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 that the whole market would go commercial. In fact, I had never dreamed at the time that uh, we were opening the door to broad commercial use of marijuana. The way the, 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 the uh, uh, initiative was written was it allowed patients and their caregivers to provide the marijuana. Now Dennis, who had a club at the time, of course, always took a very liberal provision of that and he thought that, well, you know, I, I can just be a caregiver for all of these people who are getting pot at my club and therefore it's legal for me and legal for everybody else and so forth. Well, that got shot down in court, actually, this whole caregiver defense, but at the same time, um, there was uh, there were other decisions that allowed for operation elsewhere, and uh, fortunately we got a law passed in 2003, the so-called SB 420, which recognized the right of patients to have collectives, and collectives and cooperatives were even encouraged under this, so although a caregiver couldn't necessarily do what Dennis was doing, maybe a collective or cooperative would. So we now to this day have this very vague law which allows hundreds and hundreds of uh, operations around the state to operate, distribute marijuana under the uh, uh, umbrella of being patient collectives. Unfortunately, this is very vague and ambiguous and disputed in different parts of the state, and that has led to a lot of legal problems and disputes which we would very much like to clarify. And I can tell you that right now, on the top of our agenda here, uh, 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 the medical marijuana movement's agenda here in California is to try to clarify state law by establishing real state guidelines and rules for distribution and commercial production and testing and processing and everything else of marijuana. And there's going to be a bill about that, in fact, in the legislature tomorrow, uh, which is going to be heard. And I'm hopeful that that will, that will happen this year. Um, let me uh, uh, also say another thing that, that, that's developed and never, uh, that we never saw, and it's been a recent development, was local governments became ingenious about how they responded to Prop 215. And we thought at first that we'd really solved the supply problem by allowing personal use cultivation. But starting a three or four years ago, local communities started passing ordinances uh, restricting the right to personal cultivation based on nuisance complaints, you know, the smell or attractive nuisance, kids in the area and so forth. And there are extensive restrictions on cultivation, bans on outdoor cultivation entirely in many counties of the state at the moment. Um, so this shows that the, 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 there's a uh, the, the complexity of state regulation here, because there's both local and state law, and we only address state law on that initiative, and the, the local laws still haven't worked them, their way out. Uh, finally, though, let, let me say, you know, I think uh, Prop 215 has been an, an enormous success. It has certainly showed me and a lot of other people how broad the medical uses of marijuana are. They go well beyond cancer and uh, uh, chemotherapy and glaucoma. They include many, many, many different uh, um, conditions that probably, uh, by my estimate now, probably include um, a third or a half of the frequent daily users of marijuana uh, like two, two, three percent of the adult population in California have one of these conditions of one sort or another. Um, the uh, Prop 215 has not only ex made marijuana available to hundreds of thousands, actually by our estimate now, or close to a million Californians legally. It's also, I think, spurred international interest and research on medical marijuana, which we are witnessing here today. Uh, but unfortunately, it really has not settled a lot of the scientific questions. After all these years, we still don't have a good handle on what particular strain of marijuana is good for what particular medical condition. Uh, and that is really because 
even despite Prop 215, it is still very difficult, almost impossible, for legitimate researchers to look at these different strains because none of them are considered legal within the uh, federal system. So uh, hopefully that will get sorted out in the next decade or two. <laughs> but in the meantime, I'll pass the baton to the next speaker. Thank you. Well, this is such a big story that we can tell the history. I'm sure many people in this room could tell the history of this movement from their personal perspective, and they'd all be interesting, and we'd all learn something new from them. Um, as, as you know, one of the things the scientists, one of the amazing things the scientists have discovered about the cannabinoid system is that it operates by what they call retrograde signaling, what that means is that all the neurotransmitters you ever heard about, your GABA, serotonin, they, they all um, send their signals across the gap, the synapse, to a, a, what they call the postsynaptic cell, and that cell responds. But with the cannabinoid system, the, the cannabinoids are made on demand on the receiving cell, sent back across the gap to tell the sender slow down or speed up. And it's very much like the, like an orchestra conductor, the master modulator, they call it. You know, more, more from you, Mike, less from you, please. Um, and, and that's how it works. So I, I've used this since I'm an ordinary and negative kind of person anyway. I, I, I use this to say that I, I represent the spirit of the plant in my uh, ne negativity. And, 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 and there are one or two things they all say that I, that I want to take issue with. After 98.6% agreement, Todd did not just get, get a slap on the wrist. He managed to survive in practice, but he was put on probation. And because he was such a principled person, he couldn't stand that. And he paid a large fine. It was like $50,000 fine. And he, but he, he stayed in practice. But he went and hired lawyers and spent good, what they called good, good money after bad or bad money after good to try to get that erased, that, that probation erased. And he, he, the last lawyer we had was Scott Kendall, young, young man named Scott Kendall. He took it to Superior Court to challenge the medical board's final decision. And if it had his way, he would have taken it to the U.S. Supreme Court, I'm sure. He just could not accept that he had, he had done anything wrong, because he hadn't done, done anything wrong. And one other point, this is not disagreement, but kind of an um, annotation. When Dennis Poon claimed to be a caregiver, he got a lot of, uh, you know, that he was not a caregiver, but he came from the AIDS community, which in the, in the late 80s and 90s had developed a whole set of caregivers providing different types of help there was open hand, and you know, you'd get food from here, and you'd get some clothing from here, and someone would come visit you from here, and there, there, there were these, and then I said, I'm the caregiver for your medical marijuana, and uh, we, it was not, you know, people think of him as a rally coyote or something, he has a great integrity. Um, I brought, uh, it, uh, about, about the time, I had been working uh, for many years at UC Medical Center putting out the internal weekly. And so I, I knew how to put out a four column tablet in my sleep with the PageMaker program. But in, uh, and Todd, after Prop uh, 215 passed, was trying to convince me to put out a paper that would, uh, where the doctors could share their findings and observations because he said we are establishing a new specialty and the way a specialty, way, the way medical specialists establish their credibility is by having a journal where they can publish. And um, I, I was about, I, I was about to take his, make him up on that when uh, Dallas Howe and I offered me a job in law enforcement as the public information officer for the district attorney, which gave me another angle on this incredible major story of our time, Prop 215 and the medical marijuana movement. And in that interview, 2003, I learned a lot, but the one thing that I didn't, that wasn't news, was that Two-thirds of what goes on in the Hall of Justice, even in progressive San Francisco, are drug cases. 
two-thirds of, of the, all the cases are drug cases, and um, it's, it's nuts. I'm not telling you, you anything. And also, if you walk into 850 Bryant Street, the Hall of Justice, and you go into any courtroom in the morning, I guarantee you the majority of people sitting in the back, in the bar, will be black or brown. That's just the way it is in progressive San Francisco. Um, anyway, in 2003, I, I had turned 60, and I wanted, uh, I, I loved being told as a spokesman, but I wanted to do my own writing, and um, I recognized the significance of the story, and we co-founded O'Shaughnessy, named after a personal hero of Todd's, Dr. William Brooke O'Shaughnessy, and um, we called it, uh, we, we thought of it as a cross between a, a real medical journal and a, a political defense committee leaflet. Because, <laughs> a hybrid. Because Todd was facing charges from the medical board. And getting back to that important case, all the charges against Dr. McAleer came from law enforcement. There wasn't a single patient who complained about his care. There wasn't a single caregiver or loved one or other doctor or nurse who said Dr. McAleer has done wrong by Jones. They all came from cops and sheriffs who resented the fact that they could no longer just pull somebody or that long-haired person that they hated viscerally. They could no longer just pull him over and harass him and make his life miserable. And the police response to the law enforcement response to Prop 215 is, was shameful. We have to remember 56 to 44 in the face of opposition from Clinton, from Dole, from Gray Davis, from London, from Barbara Box, from Feinstein, from C. Everett Cook, the beloved um, Surgeon General of the United States. All that opposition 50, and, and the bust of Dennis Payne in, in the San Francisco Bowers Club in, in August of 96, two months before the election, made it the biggest story, headlines, and when it was to see this just comes from a pot deal in San Francisco. And, and they really tried to make it a referendum on Dennis's right to operate. Another unsung hero of our movement, you can't give him enough credit, is Gary Trudeau, the cartoonist in Dewsbury. Because at that time, when it was close, in the, it was close, we were losing our edge over the course of that summer. London busted Dennis Pound, and Gary Trudeau did a series of strips, a week of strips, expressing the outrage of Zonka and his friends about the, uh, uh, about this, um, this outrage. And then London wrote, the, the governor, the, uh, the attorney general, wrote a, um, a letter to the publishers of all the major California papers asking them not to run the strips on the, on the eve of the of the, of the London. And um, the, 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 he held a press conference, and the cartoonists of San Francisco, uh, the editorials stood up for their right to publish the strips, and Guy Trudeau wrote in with a second set of strips in October. And they can't, can't, can't both for uh, morale and for public opinion, I don't think, he can get enough credit uh, for that. And he continues to this day to do great ones. Um, yeah, he's a, he, we're lucky to have him, him, him around. Um, so instead of going through all these back issues and, and telling the history, maybe I'll jump to the uh, current issue, which, um, thanks to Greg Ed and Mike, we have a big stack in the back over there. Let me see if I... Well, enough to talk about. Well, the lead story, we, we called it the year for concentrate, because on both the medical front and the Steiner front, it has been the feature of the concentrate. Uh, I, I, I imagine everybody in this room knows what dabs are and, and understands what's going on, but it's really, um, it's, it, it's, it's a, a heavy technological, okay, I'm good, I'm glad, I'll explain. There's, a, um, on the front page of the New York Shaughnessy's, which you can get today, um, Dr. Jeffrey Hildenrath, Todd McAleer's successor as the head of the side of cannabis clinicians, writes a piece called The Use of Dabs Gaining Popularity. And 
Debs, uh, it involves taking a high concentrate, a an oil, what used to be called hash oil, and heating it on a hot spike or nail, and um, ingesting a super high, super high volume. Uh, the effect is a rush. Dale Green reports that people are, are fainting and having other obvious um, hypertension responses to it. It's, um, but from the manufacturer's point of view and the grower's point of view, it's um, unambiguously great development because the more that you, if you've ever tried to grow weed in the bow area, you know that first five rows in the black, black the botrytis mold appears and either you've got to go out there with your scissors and cut off every moldy bud or something. But with, but with the cut, making these oils by, they're, they're both righteous methods and dangerous methods. The dangerous methods involve organic solvents like butane and hexane, with virally cause gasoline products. And she's right. Um, and her driver says, if it smells like a lot of fluid, don't use it. Um, there's a real, there's, uh, and of course, kids in their garages are uh, going to have access to butane and hexane, but they're not going to have access to $100,000 CO2 um, supercritical extractors, which can do it right and keep the, keep, but there are great advantages. One of the great advantages is you get the terpenes. You don't use the terpenes when you're making one of these cold solvent extractions. And as we know that it's not just the cannabinoids that are contributing to the effects we all appreciate. It's the terpenes, the compounds that give cannabis its smell. So, so the advantage from the, um, if you look at the big picture of production, the grower doesn't have to worry so much about mold, and the trim becomes valuable because the trim can also be um, extracted. So it's really going to change. Um, I, I, a friend recently showed me a, a, a new, latest generation vaporizer, and it was hardly bigger than a cigar, and it had the red oil, the, the, the cannabis oil extract um, in a little um, reservoir, and you push the button and you touch. Like one of these. <laughs> Very much like one of those. They, it's, it's, that's just what I'm trying to say. It's very hard to, to not see that this, that this is going to, because you, it, it doesn't, you, you, you can use it in a, in a car if you're pulled over the car, it things don't smell away. My mind was blown the other night, I want to share with you. Um, I'm, I'm reading a book called Tastes of Paradise by a German uh, anthropologist named Wolfgang Schadelbusch. And he's writing about um, liquor coming in. Uh, it used to be wine, right? The people used to drink wine and beer, and suddenly they had access to liquor. And I think that that's this, so, something along those lines can happen. Spiritist liquor had existed since the Middle Ages. Up until the 16th century, it had been used only as a medicine. Apparently, there existed no need as yet for a drink so high in alcoholic content. Beer still sufficed as a means of nutrition and intoxication for the lower classes. In the 17th century, liquor became an everyday drink. As with so many innovations which later proved important for industrialization, liquor too found its first use in the military. It seems to have been a con concomitant of the new discipline to which the military was subjected in the 17th century. The individual soldier who had previously been able to operate with relative autonomy became in the 17th and 18th century a cog in the wheel of a mathematically, rationalistically organized corps of troops. Liquor, which he received in his daily ration, served as a sort of physiological and psychological lubricant to guarantee his smooth functioning. The military's liquor allotment seemed to have ensured the required measure of anesthetization, that is not intoxication, to make the soldier an integral member of the mechanical corps. Here lay the rudiments of later industrial discipline. And slight digression. Now I get more germane. Liquor dealt a death blow to, to traditional drinking, which had been based on wine and beer. 
These might be termed organic alcoholic beverages, in that their alcoholic content is identical to the sugar content of the plants from which they are prepared. In liquor, this relationship with nature was severed. Distillation raised the alcohol content far beyond the natural limits. To be precise, the spilled spirits contained 10 times the alcohol of traditional beer, which could not help but have far-reaching consequences. Whereas beer and wine are drunk slowly in long sips and the inebriation process is gradual, liquor is tossed off and intoxication is more or less instantaneous. Liquor thus represents a process of acceleration of intoxication, intrinsically related to other processes of acceleration in the modern age. Thanks. Um, I, I anticipate that um, this new mode of delivery will somehow... Ch is, that my, is that my time limit? Okay. Anyway, that's the story on the it's, it's a new delivery method. It's a super concentrate, and um, it, 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 it removes... It's not grass anymore that people can be using. That's what I'm trying to say. It's not the plant. It can, it can be argued, and I'm sure it will be argued, that um, using a properly extracted, uh, a proper, a properly made extract is healthier than smoking flowers. Um, but it, I said it can be argued, will be argued. I would say I'm arguing it. I like the plant myself. I'm a hippie gal. Um, yeah. Well, it's, but it's, it's coming. It's, uh, it's, um, if you pick up the paper, you can read Dr. Hogan Rather's um, misgivings about it. Um, the big one is the, is the solvents. Um, but I get, uh, Martin tells me that people are snapping up these CO2 extraction devices. Um, I guess we can't argue with progress. Um, let's see what else. Uh, in this issue, uh, I, I wrote obits for two friends who died last year. This is happening more and more often. And one of them was a man named Carl Oglesby who was a, a leader of Students for Democratic Society in the 1960s. And I couldn't help think that in the 1960s, we aspired to change the society. And now we have a, a righteous group, Students for Sensible Drug Policy, which is trying to change this finite aspect of our society. And I think what happened, well, I've, I've evidently what happened at the end of the 60s was, Instead of a fusion of all these um, arms of the movement, if you, say, if you said my cousins were involved with the movement in the 60s, he, your cousin was for ending the war in Vietnam, civil rights, ending discrimination of all kinds, women, equality, gays, I, come on in. It was a movement, the movement was this man, or this, whatever, whichever side of the peaceful Vincent or the militant force, but it meant something more than just in the world, just legalizing drugs, or just this one thing. And instead of a fusion at the end of the 60s, we got this fusion into what's now a thousand separate groups. And it's, inter it's uh, coincidental, that, that's not the right word, it's poignant, that uh, Norma was founded in 1970, uh, very end of the 60s, and it's not coincidental that the money came from Hugh Hefner, a, what we might call an enlightened capitalist, who probably sensed on some level that it would be more in his long-term interests to have everybody going on their set, pursuing their separate interests rather than all of us uniting behind our common interests in creating a democratic society. Thank you. We're going to go through these quickly, and I don't know how, I mean, some people are quite familiar with CBD and others don't know much about it at all, but as I said, non-psychoactive, unlike THC, the high causer, it doesn't make you stoned. In fact, it can counter the psychoactivity of, CB, of THC if it's in, present in sufficient quantities. Uh, typically, the second most prominent compound in a strain, even though most of the strains in dispensaries THC dominant in very little, probably less than 1% CBD, and the rest of the 100 cannabinoids hardly there at all. 
um, astonishing therapeutic potential. Its molecular structure was elucidated by Dr. Raphael Mishulin, the person who did the same for a THC, an Israeli scientist. Uh, he did, he uh, basically unlocked the key to CBD in 63, the following year for, for THC. So CBD he was working with initially. Uh, little research into CBD until the discovery of the uh, cannabinoid receptors in the brain in 1989, uh, the first receptors. Um, there had been some research in Brazil, Israel, uh, were the two places, but for the most part, uh, to the extent there was scientific re research into the plant, it was um, focusing on THC. Uh, oops, I think we're jumping around here. Endocannabinoid system, you could spend three hours on this slide. I can't do this now. Uh, but um, two sets of receptors in the brain and central nervous system, CB1, cannabinoid 1 receptor, um, CB2 in the periphery, in the peripheral nervous system, in the, or, uh, peripheral organs. Uh, THC binds to both receptors. When THC binds to the CB1 receptor in the brain, you feel stoned. When it binds to the CB2 receptor in the periphery, you feel less pain. Uh, so that CB2 action is not psychoactive. It's just the, the CB1 part. Okay. Um, two, there are two pr uh, primary endogenous compounds in the brain and body that bind to these receptors. There are actually more than two, but the, the, the two main ones are called anandamide and TRG. What is the function of this system? And uh, neuroprotection and homeostasis and buffering stress. And again, one can talk about this at length, but I will want to get to the CBD stuff, and I, I don't expect you to see this too well. I just, I refer to these abstracts to illustrate the point. When we talk about a f one of the main functions of the endocannabinoid system is to uh, restore homeostasis, so I, I picked a few abstracts. The role of the endocannabinoid system in controlling energy homeostasis, the second one, endocannabinoid system in the control of glucose homeostasis. It does this for all the physiological systems that have been uh, studied, bringing things back to balance. If you go one way, if your immune system kicks into gear to fight a fever, something's got to bring it down when the work is done. That's what the endocannabinoid system is, like a dimmer switch. On, uh, you know, up and down a little bit to, to bring things where they need to be. Uh, the, the last um, abstract from Matthew Hill, a Canadian uh, scientist, endogenous cannabinoid signaling is essential for stress adaptation. Buffering stress is a, is a key, uh, key component. And now I want to focus on uh, CBD. I'm going to run through this very quickly because uh, we don't have a lot of time. A uh, study from Brazil, September 2011, established, oops, here I am. Um, my apologies here, uh, establishes that CBD is, uh, chronic use and high doses are well tolerated in humans. No known adverse side effects, but for dry mouth, oral hemp is astringent. And if you take CBD, you also get a dry mouth as if you just smoked it. Um, CBD's anti-tumor effects. This is from research done at California Pacific Medical Center in San Francisco. Uh, I'll just read the title of the abstract itself, Pathways Mediating the Effects of CBD on the Reduction of Breast Cancer Cell Proliferation, Invasion, and Metastasis. And the scientist there uh, not only was able to establish that CBD, pure CBD, CBD can, uh, has this uh, anti-tumoral effect, shrinks tumors, uh, but they also identified one of the molecular mechanisms, how this is done. CBD turns off the expression of this a particular gene, ID1 gene, which when it's uh, active, it's actually active in the womb when, the, uh, when the, uh, the organism is formed, is being formed. You need a lot of cells to be created. That gene is supposed to turn off afterwards, and it's supposed to stay off, but it comes back on in terms of uh, with cancer. And this gene is implicated in a dozen different very aggressive types of cancer, prostate cancer, colon cancer, many others. So CBD has this ability to turn this, to silence this gene. That's what they discovered. Um, this is an image from the California Pacific Medical Center. On the, on the left is uh, the darker blotches are actually the, the breast cancer cells. They, they work with human cell lines that have been kept alive after people die, and they work with them. And uh, this is, Most of these uh, slides will refer to preclinical research, animal studies, not human studies, which is difficult to do. Uh, to the right is after the CBD exposure, you see much less of the big dark blotches. Um, and I've seen moving images of this sort of thing as well. You can Literally see the CBD, you know, just clobbering these breast cancer mo uh, molecules. Anyway, uh, 
uh, also Pacific, California Pacific Medical Center, can have a dial that enhances the inhibitory effects of uh, THC on human glioblastoma cell proliferation and survival. That's brain cancer, very impressive brain, brain cancer. CBD and THC combined have a very powerful inhibitory effect on brain cancer, glioblastoma. What they found at the CPMC is that pure THC also has uh, anti-tumoral effects. Pure CBD does, but when combined together, it's more potent than either of the two are. And that's why we are the THC Defense Committee. <laughs> anyway, because they really, be, you know, it, it's deceptive. I'm going to focus a lot on this one molecule, but we should always keep in mind that the, the, the key thing is the plant and where it comes from and, and how it all works together. Um, Neuropathic pain. Uh, we, we heard a lot of good reports, incidentally, in terms of neuropathic pain, but you do got to get the right ratio. And some people, I mean, optimally, you want half and half, one to one uh, CBD and THC, but uh, people can't tolerate uh, a lot of THC oftentimes, so you can increase the ratio of CBD to THC. And there's very, you know, a lot of variants in, in that regard, not just from strains, but extracts can be made specifically with different ratios, as is happening now in California, and one can access these extracts. Um, effective for chronic pain and peripheral neur neuropathy in a rat mo model. I'm not going to talk much about this, just sort of read it because it's a powerful one, the cumulative effect. CBD exerts anti-convulsant effects in animal models of temporal lobe and partial seizures. Um, very, very um, profound results for the kids with Trevet syndrome and the, the kind of intractable epilepsy that Val was talking about earlier. A CBD, a, a high concentrate, has remarkable results. It's, it's Produce. And CBD lowers the incidence of diabetes in non-obese diabetic mice. What they do is they take mice, half of them, they genetically delete the cannabinoid receptors. Um, they uh, create disease models in these animals, so they all have, or, or have diabetes created in these mice. The ones that are exposed to CBD have less incidence or less uh, dramatic diabetes. That, that's the kind of things that they do that can manipulate through di different uh, techniques. Uh, this is quite an amazing one. Acute administration of CBD in vivo, meaning in a um, live situation, suppresses ischemia-induced cardiac arrhythmias and reduces infarct size when given at reperfusion. British Journal of Pharmacology 2010, what it means, they induce a stroke in a, in a mouse. They, and again, exposing the, uh, some mice beforehand to CBD or afterwards, and they find that when the, uh, as a result of the, the stroke, you know, your heart, your cardiac system goes crazy, and you, you have arrhythmia, the CBD administration uh, stops the arrhythmia. There is no drugs on the market today for arrhythmia, uh, and that's a very common condition as people get older. So this alone is a great potential medicinally. Again, keep in mind, this is animal studies, not human studies. And it, they don't always transfer from mice and rats to people, but uh, we've got good leads on this. CBD, a cannabis sativa constituent, as an antipsychotic drug. Uh, this is an area I just learned yesterday at Yale University. They're doing human uh, experiments with human subjects giving pure CBD to schizophrenics. Uh, there was a recent uh, experiment in Germany that compared CBD as an antipsychotic drug. I think it's Risperdal, the standard, uh, very uh, toxic. Um, they found CBD to be as effective in terms of suppressing psychotic symptoms, but no side effects, unlike the big pharma drug, which is, you know, tears a person apart. This was from a study in Brazil in 2006. Um, this is an, an a very interesting area in, in, in terms of medical marijuana in general that, that's, I think, underappreciated to some degree. Um, a study published by the Journal of Natural Products, this is the publication of the American Chemical Society, it's very mainstream, we're talking about 2008, tested THC, CBD, and uh, CBG cannabigerol, a couple other cannabinoids for their antibacterial properties, and they found, remarkably, CBD showed potent activity against a, a variety of methylene resistant staph trains. That's MRSA. This MRSA kills 20,000 people in the United States last year. This is the antibiotic resistant bacteria that the World Health Organization has pegged as one of the looming health crises globally for the century. CBD smashes it in a test tube. So, or uh, in a petri dish, probably, more like it. Anyway, continuing. This is from a, um, actually a patent awarded by the U.S. government to researchers from the NIH. 
uh, actually specifically to the Department of Health, where they work with CBD and THC uh, investigating the uh, neuroprotective properties and antioxidant properties. And you probably, if you've been following the, issue, the, the story, you've heard about this patent that was awarded back in 2003, since expired. Um, but the statement is quite uh, amazing, considering that this is from the federal government that classifies marijuana as a Schedule One drug with no medical value. Here's what they're saying in the patent. Cannabinoids have been found to have antioxidant properties and are found to have particular application as neuroprotectants for example, in limiting neurological damage following ischemic insults, such as stroke and trauma, or in the treatment of neurodegenerative diseases, such as Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and HIV dementia. So that's what the federal government says about the isolated cannabinoids. But of course, they have nothing to do with the plant, in their opinion. Um, CBD is a neuroprotectant. Um, this is quite amazing. It's from the Journal of Neuroscience, you know, very leading academic journal. September 2007, it's a French study, and they looked at mad cow disease, prion uh, in infection. These are the neurological illnesses that can be transmitted. With Alzheimer's, you can't give it to somebody. Um, with mad cow, you can. And there's a whole group of prion infections that you can. They're very dangerous illnesses. So this French study concluded CBD may protect neurons against the multiple uh, molecular and cellular factors involved in different steps of the neurodegenerative process, which takes place during prion inc infection. Now, they, they tested at various different phases. In every case, CBD basically just smashed it. So that's quite interesting, too. Um, CBD neurogenic, not only neuroprotective, but it actually promotes, stimulates new brain cells to grow. Um, in this particular study, a friend, a German and Mexican scientists collaborating uh, states that refer specifically to the pro-neurogenic, the brain cell creating effects of CBD. And there's a, quite a bit of other research in this area, too, that's interesting. Um, CBD modifies gene expression. Remember the ID1 gene for breast cancer that was shown? It turns out CBD does this for loads of genes, turns them on and off. Uh, the only thing I've heard of that has, is more um, uh, potent, if you will, in this way is vitamin D. Uh, and in fact, vitamin D also turns off that ID1 gene. Five minutes, I'm told. And I will, will try to do this in five minutes. Um, well, I don't want to run through all the numbers, but just uh, when, when they do this, t uh, they actually use THC in this study. This is an Israeli study from a couple of years ago in CBD. And they have a way of uh, exposing uh, certain gene profiles to, to substances to find out um, how the gene expression is being affected. Uh, the THC in this study of 24,000 genes affected 94, CBD affected uh, over 1,200. Um, and that's the, the study that I actually refer to. Um, I'll talk a little bit about this because it's, uh, I think it's something for even folks who are familiar with CBD, this will be kind of new. Um, and it gets into, uh, well, PPARs are, t cannabinoid receptors sit on the surface of a cell. They're like, kind of like, think of them as hair follicles. So, you know, some of the hair is out and then some of it's in and it, and it responds to things in the blood and the body and sends messages into the cell. A PPAR is a receptor that sits on the surface of the nucleus of a cell, which raises the question, well, how does anything get in there to bind with it if you have to get inside the cell? And the scientists have mapped it all out, figured it out. There's certain transport of molecules that take the, what they call the ligands, the, the things that activate the receptors, and take them inside. So it turns out that CBD directly activates some of these receptors directly binds to them. And uh, what they're finding about these PPARs, it's a whole family of receptors. There's one called PPAR gamma that CBD links into, which turns out when people have what they call polymorphisms, strain, um, kind of a mutation is not quite the right word, but in the genes that encode these receptors, if there's some unusual amino acid uh, repeats or sequence repeats, or there's something a little bit off about the, uh, the, 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 that gene that encodes these, it correlates in particular to PPAR gamma, diabetes, obesity, metabolic syndrome, they're finding. And PPAR alpha, it correlates when we have this polymorphism to schizophrenia, high, high rates of schizophrenia among people have it. And CBD also interacts with this PPAR alpha, not directly. It suppresses a, um, an enzyme that allows what naturally hits these receptors to increase. Um, anyway, how CBD works, and this is, we're going to try to tie it up now. Okay, you heard about all these receptors. Well, here's an interesting one. CBD doesn't really bind to the cannabinoid receptors. It has very little affinity 
to the, the, the receptors in the central nervous system, which why it doesn't make you high, or even in the periphery. It works in other ways. It turns out that CBD links to all these other receptors in the body. It links to a particular serotonin receptor. Um, which uh, is partly responsible for why it has an antidepressant effect. It links to an aden adenosine receptor, which is uh, caffeine also links to, which is why CBD is um, sort of clarifying and energizing. Um, it links to, um, uh, well, a bunch of other things that are non-cannabinoid receptors. And then it works in other ways as well. It works through in receptor independent mechanisms. CBD has effects, confers therapeutic effects, and have nothing to do with receptors. And I'll, uh, this is how I'll end it, to discuss this a little bit of how that works, because it's quite fascinating. Oh, these are some of the receptors I refer to, that non-cannabinoid receptors that uh, CBD binds to. Um, uh, the last point I want to make in the interest of the time is what, how CBD acts indirectly on the endocannabinoid system by suppressing an enzyme that's involved in breaking down our own cannabinoids that we have naturally, that we referred to them earlier, 2-AG and anandamide. Well, these are kind of fatty molecules that are biosynthesized. Enzymes are used to create them in the body and to break them down. And there's a particular enzyme, this FI, as we call it, referred to in the science conferences, the fatty acid anhydrolase, that breaks down our own cannabinoids. And this is a natural process that happens. They're created and then they break down. Well, if you have a f something funny going on with the gene that encodes your pha, you might have too much pha. It means you'll have too little cannabinoids because you have a lot of pha, it breaks down your cannabinoids. So that can result in a lot, a lot of poor health, basically. And uh, the fact that CBD has an ability to suppress this enzyme that breaks down our own cannabinoids, so it kind of keeps our cannabinoid levels higher, or, or maybe where they should be, you know, if you have a deficiency in that. So it's a, a remarkable aspect to, to uh, CBD as a medicine. But I, I can't run through the other slides because I don't have time, but I do want to come back to emphasize here that Project CBD is not just about CBD, it's about the whole plant, and that we emphasize CBD to remind people that we're not talking just about, it's ironic in a way, here we're talking about a single molecule, but it's really talking about a single molecule to sort of refute the notion that it's all about a single molecule. <laughs> and, that, and that's perfectly fitting for cannabis, actually. It's sort of, somehow it's always like that. Um, and and I, I can't stress that point en enough. And, and what, for, what happened with Fred and I, we were just in a sort of a I call it luck or a curse, I don't know. But these strains, the first few strains when the labs started emerging to test the strains, it was first um, uh, the Harborside's lab, uh, Steep Hill, was, and many others that followed. Once in a while, once in a blue moon, they would discover a CBD strain, a little spike. And, and somehow these, these strains gravitated toward Fred and I. And Fred, being the retrograde messenger, came up with the brilliant idea with this booming billion dollar industry. What are we going to do? I thought, well, wow, maybe we can actually support our journalism. No, we're going to give them away. So we gave them away, gave them away, gave them away, because it was such an important thing and such a great story. Um, and it's an unfolding story, very much so. And we know that because every day we hear, hear from people all over the world that want to know how they can get it. And you can get it now in many different ways. But I think the way to the future for this is uh, in some ways less, but less uh, obvious plant and, and more concentrates drawn from the plant calibrated to be very, very specific so uh, people can find their maximum THC because the THC and the CBD together are, are what's going to give the best medicine uh, oftentimes. Um, and that could vary for, for many people. Anyway, that's that. Thank you very much. Thanks.